Hello, everyone. Now, everyone, I think it's nine o'clock on the dot. So I'd like to say a very big welcome to you all. I know it'll take people a few minutes to register and, and settle down. So I just introduce myself. My name is Fiona Hopkins and I'm the festival director. This is our fifth annual festival. We started in 2016. Uh, it was very small to start with. And uh, this year, when we realized that it would have to be a virtual festival, to be honest, we were sad um, because we so enjoy meeting people coming to our area and uh, sharing our love of the dark skies with them. So when we realized it had to be a, a virtual affair, we were first saddened and we very then quickly re realized um, what an amazing opportunity this was when we saw people signing up from all corners of the globe for our little festival. Uh, so we've been really overwhelmed with the response. Uh, to date, I think 1,010 people have signed up for the day uh, from uh, 21 different countries, as far east as Australia, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, United Arab Emirates, and as far west as the United States and even Chile. So, uh, of course, depending on time zones, some of those people may not be with us yet, uh, but uh, We've just been overwhelmed by that response, and we're looking forward to a great day. We want, we wish we could welcome you here in person, uh, but I'm not sure where we'd fit you all, to be honest. We are live in some very small little villages in the west of Ireland, and uh, it'd get a little crowded if you were all here in person. Before I introduce our first speaker, I'll introduce the team bringing the festival to you today. You are going to have four hosts throughout the day. There you have Georgia, Mags, Carol, and myself there at the end. You'll hear our voices throughout the day, and uh, I just thought you'd like to put a face to the names. You may feel that we're virtual entities, we, but I can promise you we are very real, and we're all sitting in our respective homes today, nervous but excited. Georgia is in Newport, Carol is in Mulrani, uh, Mag there works in Ballycroy and uh, I think is at home in Westport today and I'm here in Newport in County Mayo. We as a team we haven't actually met in person I think since maybe June so uh, we're all living in a virtual world at the moment and we've organized this festival through through our own Zoom meetings. Uh, in fact if you see throughout the day that our we look a little, we don't look quite like our photographs. That's because none of us has managed to get to a hairdresser in about three months. So uh, you'll have to forgive, you'll have to forgive that. There are other helpers behind the scene and we're all here to make your day as enjoyable as possible. In fact, we want to you to imagine that you are here with us in Mayo. And to help you with that, we will show short video clips and slideshows throughout the day featuring different elements of our community and we hope you enjoy them and that it helps to make you feel that you're here with us in person in a rather stormy west of Ireland today. That's us here in, um, just in case you're wondering where, where we are, we are there in the west of Ireland, we're in Newport, Mulrani and Ballycroy, which as you can see surrounds Mayo Dark Sky Park. Now I want to introduce Michael. Michael Chambers, uh, I think I've known him for about 15 years. He's the head guide at Wild Nafe and Ballycroy National Park. So it's in his job description to know a bit about the mountains around us here. But more importantly, it, I think it's in his DNA. It is his passion. His family have lived in the foothills of the Nafe and Beg Mountains for many generations. And that passion and deep understanding of the area has led to some fascinating, adventurous, as you're about to find out. So to hear more, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Michael Chambers. Thank you, Fiona. And good morning, everybody. Uh, you're very welcome here this morning from um, a very wild filter centre in Belly Croy at the Wild Nathan National Park. And uh, today we'll be giving you a presentation about our journey through the Nathan Beg Mountains that make up the spine of the National Park and the Costa Mio Dark Sky itself. Um, I'd like to mention Meg Flaherty, our supervisor guide of both 
National Park here, Billy Croy, and in Connemara. And uh, Meg's going to be assisting me today, where she will be um, playing some of the videos that will take you inside some of the mountains that wish us on the journey today. So if you bear with me, I'm just going to bring up our presentation now and start off. So oh, here we go. So our journey today is going to take us to the Nathan Beg Mountains. And um, basically, it's going to center about um, the history that was exposed to me at a young age in the mountains, about the troubled times in Ireland and of all the activities that took place around us where we grew up in um, Shamor in the mountains. And uh, I was very eager to find out more about the history of the mountains as I grew older and it brought me on a fantastic journey. And that's what we're going to go through with you today. So starting off on the journey, we're going to focus about the West Mayo flying column that we see here on the left of the screen. And uh, this picture was taken in Belly Croy here itself and Sheon Lodge during the, during the truce. And uh, my grandfather's featured in this picture in the center with the hat. And um, it was stories about him that got me very, very interested in the mountains. And here on the right hand side is a picture that was done by my son JD Chambers of the Morrigan. And uh, of course, she was the shape shifter and she could take the form of a crow beneath the, the moon as she was the moon goddess. And so we're going to start off talking about these rebels and we're going to finish off talking about the moon goddess, the Morrigan. So I grew up in the Navenbeg Mountains and here's one of my favourite locations in the Navenbeg Mountains that's accessible to everybody because it was taken from the side of a road just on Bonavilla Hill overlooking Bonavilla Lake and the Navenbeg Mountains in the background with the sun setting down beyond them. Um, I grew up in the village of Shamore and here's Shamore and Mount Turklu reflecting in the calm waters of Loch Fia. And um, just above my house there, on the southern end of Turkey Mountain, again, we're exposed to history of the penal laws at a young age from school, where Sister McAlash, first class of national school teacher, would tell us about uh, mass rocks in the Burrishul area. And one such place was at the back of my house there, where we have a large rock, which called Karak and Awak, the lookout rock, where somebody would be on post looking out over the southern end of the mountains. Um, from there, they had a great view all the way in towards Newport, where at the time, um, Cromerlian soldiers had taken um, Burishul Abbey and turned it into um, a fort for themselves. And uh, Mass was said in a hollow just to the north of that, Karakanoak, in, in a place named Log and Afrin, the hollow of the Mass. So there's a little ravine that comes down from that hollow that brings you down to the, to the village, roughly um, near the centre of the mountain and uh, where you could access the hollow through the cover of the ravine. And uh, it was a safe enough area for, for people to gather up for mass and be in a high elevation to look out for troops. But unfortunately, a story we were told um, at school times was that um, the soldiers became aware of this as a, plat, a mass area, and they laid in wait up on the mountainside for the mass gatherers to get together. And um, when the mass had started, the person on watch realized the soldiers were coming from the rear of the mountain and but there wasn't enough time to get the priest away but he, he alerted the crowd and they gathered around the priest and an old man present was said to change clothes with the priest so when the soldiers came they took the old man thinking him to be the priest and hung him in the valley below so the priest was free to go and continue on the the mass now at a young age of course when you're told history about that from where you come from um you get a, a a kind of a lore to know more and more about the events that took place many years ago before your time. So at a young age, I was very inquisitive. And um, when I started going off to the mountains, gathering sheep with my father, he was a small um, sheep farmer here in the west of Ireland on the mountains. And um, I was always eager to go to the mountains with him. And um, so I started off going to the hills with him, gathering the sheep and um, when we'd be up in the mountains, bringing home the sheep, I'd constantly be asking him questions about the mountains. And he, he'd be testing me, like, why would you want to know about the mountains? And why would you want to know this and that? And I said, because I want to know. And i tell him the bits and pieces that I'd be told in school. And he'd bring it on. So he started telling me stories from 
the War of Independence, when I started asking about mountains, what were their names? And he told me about Bingurum, Bingurum, Skelpgurum, as he called us, the Blue Rocks, and uh, the mom next to us. And, uh, and I asked what the mom meant, and he meant like a saddle where people would travel over between the mountains through the moms into the valleys to valleys. And then he told me it was there that your grandfather brought the rebels to safety during the, after the Khmer ambush during the War of Independence. And this was my first exposure that uh, my grandfather had any involvement um, in the War of Independence because he was long dead before I was born. And uh, immediately I said, what? And could you tell me more about this? So as the year rolled on, he used to tell me bits and bits and more and more. And um, as I grew older, I uh, did a lot of research in uh, any local books I could find about out of the West Mayoflan column to see could I see my grandfather's name mentioned and did it all match up with my father told me. So here we have a cover of a book, Memories of My Old Man by Edward O'Malley. That was one book I found great information in and, and a big thank you to Pat Carey from Glen Hess who sent that book on to me. And also um, Ernie O'Malley's A Raid and Rallies also gave me great help and I'll talk a bit more about that. To the left there we have uh, a Celtic cross in that's out the Glen Hess Road that was to commemorate the Battle of Skirder. And the Battle of Skirder, which is uh, just on the east side of the Nathan Bag Mountains between um, England and Laura, just to the east of uh, Buckham Mountain, um, that took place after the Kamina ambush. The Kamina ambush didn't go very well for the rebels, they suffered a lot of casualties and injured, and they had to retreat to the safety of the mountains. And the people of Skirder looked after them very well and they give them attention and whatnot. But it wasn't long until the RIC and the Black Intent were making their way towards their positions in Skirder, uh, with an idea to capture the whole column. So the leader of the West Oak Flying Column, Michael Caroy, had to think fast. So he sent to the Shmoe Battalion to Tom Carey, Captain Tom Carey, um, looking for scouts to bring the, vol the volume uh, the main body of the column to the safety of the mountains, while he and his officers would stay back and uh, keep fire on the enemy forces to draw, and draw, draw them away from the main body of the column. And uh, I remember my father telling me about this story, and um, he said our grandfather was, my grandfather was sent um, to lead the men along with another chambersman called Green Chambers to the safety of the hills. And um, he told me back in the time that um, as they were making their way along through the hills, that an aeroplane was up in, the, up in the sky, circling the mountains, looking for the column. And they had to hide under the cover of the header um, until the plane passed by. And this was something that um, I found sort of mentioned in this book by Edward O'Malley, how the common men had to lie in cover for hours as an aeroplane sent out from the base in Kesselbar, circling the mountain. So... I remember my father, that time my father telling me this story. We were in Glenamoo across the flat bogs, heading up to Upwee, which is a small hill just to the north of, uh, to, to the east of uh, Glenamoo Mountain. And uh, we were back in the early 80s, um, there was absolutely no vegetation left on the, the plains of the bogs along Glenamoo. And um, to me, a bogland at that young age was just a complete wasteland without any vegetation on top. And in the wintertime, it was just black exposed mud, um, wet. And in the summertime, it became dried up, flaky bog that used to wash into the, the rivers when the rains would come. And I remember him telling me that the men had to hide under the header. And, um, and I said back to him, I said, what header? And he goes, well, he said, unfortunately, he said, because of um, overstock and wanting, all the head that disappeared from the hills, but not so long ago that it would be up to the height of your legs. And um, over the years, in certain parts, there's been a lot of good work done in restoring the vegetation in the mountains, and a lot of the hills have made a good recovery. Some still have a bit to do. But um, it was early exposure to me that uh, the landscape had alter altered in a, in a way over the years. And... Um, he was very passionate about talking about uh, the struggle to get the land back and that we have to do better to maintain the land and uh, to bring it back to its former glory. So 
As the men hid under the heather and the plane moved on, they managed to move on through the hills and they made their way to Glindawulla, where they had three wounded with them. Here the column broke up again. The three wounded were dressed as women and uh, they were brought by a moisture car that belonged to an ex-RIC man. And uh, they managed to make their way around the back road towards the Kessel Bar, towards Glen Island direction. The Kessel Bear members of the column then wanted to go with them, so Green Chambers went with them, and uh, they went up towards Letcher near Kessel Bear. The rest of the column made their way back down to Bonavilla Lake. At this time, over 500 Black and Tan forces were making their way in circulation formation towards the mountains. They were coming up from Bellina towards Bonavilla. They were also heading down from Westport towards Shmoor, and uh, you had members of uh, Black and Tans coming from as far as way as Sligo and from Galway. So they were completely circulating the mountains. So my grandfather had to move quick and uh, he moved the column into Gowlon, which is near Bonavilla there. And the good people of Gowlon gave them a good feed, as recorded. From there, it was said that they spent the night in a cave on Curran Hills and made on their journey to Glenamu and... Um, into Glenderhurk, where the people in Glenderhurk looked after them very, very well, and the column escaped. And uh, Kilroy and his officers even managed to escape from the fight out in Glenlora, and they suffered one casualty, Jim Brown, and uh, the rest of the column made it to safety. Now, I set out as I got older to find these caves in uh, Corrine Hill, it was a personal thing for me to find them because I could very, find very, very re little reference about these caves in any research I did. So the rock formation in the Nivenbeg Mountains is not suitable for what we would associate with caves with because it's, the rock is so hard that uh, natural caves can't be formed in this manner. So there would have been a bit of doubt that there wasn't any caves there and that it was just an add-on into the story or maybe they just hid under rocks. And uh, so, Bush, my father would have been very eminent. Yeah, the caves were there, but he would never say where they were on the hill. And uh, so, as I got older, I set out to look for these caves. And um, I got a good clue in Ernie O'Malley's book here, a little bit of the page shown here to the left, because this is a little account by Ned Malone, and um, he was with the column, and they were hoping to bring the wounded to the caves on Corrine Hill and uh, which wouldn't have been suitable because it's quite steep to get up there. And uh, Green Chambers said we'd go further into the hill as the Black and Tan troops were making their way to Shamor and they would have been spotted at that stage. So he gives an account where the caves were underneath the cliffs of Curry, which stretches its narrow spine below Nathan Bay to the west of the Arthur Honey River. Um, so Curry is a large, a long, low mountain and um, Nathan Beg is right above it. And I do know, I did know where the cliffs were. So I headed her up there uh, looking around the cliffs to see could I find any entrance into the mountain through a cave. And I had no luck. However, while I was up there, a kestrel rose out of the cliffs and she hovered over me screeching. Uh, she had a nest somewhere on the, on the cliff. So what I did was I climbed up on these huge boulders they were just beneath the cliff to see could ID where her nest was. So I'd let uh, the rangers in the National Park know where this beautiful bird of prey was nesting. And um, while I was up on these um, boulders, I noticed a passageway that um, made its way through the boulders. And uh, I thought I'd go in and have a look there. It's probably nothing, but I'd have a look. And um, sure enough, when I went up to the end of this passageway, um, it opened up at a, at a 90 degree angle to the left into a large tunnel that went in underneath these boulders. My heart jumped with joy because these are the cliffs. This is what was said in the book. The caves beneath the cliffs on Corrine Hill, not in the cliffs. So we've been looking in the wrong place for years, obviously, uh, for these caves. Because when I couldn't initially find them in the cliffs of the Corrine Mountain a couple of years before I even found them, um, I was searching every mountain around Curring Vague, Turklu, and whatnot. And um, the great advantage about these caves um, on Curring Hill is if you look 
there's my daughter Shannon looking out to the east of the Nathan Bag Mountains. You have a huge view of the mountains around you. And this was the area where the Black and Tan forces were concentrating their circling movement it was away from the current hill. So the column had managed to slip through their, their lines and were watching them from a safe distance as they were circling around the mountains. And they could even as I said, could hear them interrogating the people of Shamor and shooting livestock and threatening the people. And um, we have to remember that the forest that we see there in Wild Nathan, that wasn't there back in 1922. That's the, a recent addition from the 50s and 60s of mass plantation of the bogland areas and mountain areas um, of the forestation of the west of Ireland. So it was a clear run into the mountains and uh, the locals knew how to to roam through the mountains quite freely through the through the valleys between the hills and whatnot. And this would have been a very difficult terrain for um, the Black and Tan forces to, to manoeuvre their way through. They, they did circle the hills and whatnot, but even in Glenlaurie where Michael Kilroy and his men were hiding out underneath the turf bank, the Black and Tan forces opened heavy fire along the hillside, but they didn't emerge up the hills. So again, it would tell you about the hair going. So as I went into the caves, hoping to find something of um, remembrance from the old uh, times, I found nothing belonged to them, but I did find other bones and uh, scattered around the floor of the caves in different areas. And an interesting one was an invertebrate I found is actually off a horse. And how would that get up there? And again, it was another story we were told from the penal law times that there was a man in the locality who had a great horse. And um, the agent were sent out from the landlords to retrieve this horse off this man as, as the Catholic couldn't, had to give up a horse if it was worth the value of five pounds um, if the landlord deemed he wanted it. But uh, when the agent came for the horse, um, the owner wasn't having any of it. And it said that he beat the agent and he rode off with the horse. Obviously, never to be seen again because he would have been arrested and probably imprisoned or transported. So it was said that he spent the rest of his days on Curring Hill and he stayed in a cave and he kept the horse hidden. So I often wondered, was this bone connected to that horse that, uh, that ran away during the penal times with its owner? Um, also in the Curring Cave, I found in the corner of the boulders an area where there seemed to have been a lot of fire activity uh, once upon a time. Obviously, this would not have been from the West Mayo Flying Column would spend the night there that night because if they lit a fire, the smoke would have given away their positions. So this shows that this cave had been in use long before the West Mayo Flying Column were there. And in the corner, in through the ashes, I found some more animal bones that have some burn marks on them, possibly off a sheep and whatnot. So at this stage, I'm going to ask my um, colleague, uh, Meg, to play you a little video. So this little video is going to take you from inside the, the caves and uh, it's going to show you what it was like um, for the West Mill Flying Column as they spend the night up there. So just bear with us for a second. Michael, while we're waiting for the video, I have a question from Kira, and she's asking, why did the heather disappear? You referenced the heather that your, your father mentioned. Yeah, so, um, the real, the real reason why the heather disappeared um, would have been um, in the 70s, um, the premiums were brought in to encourage farmers to, to open up on sheep numbers. And uh, unfortunately, um, it went a bit out of control where we had uh, a numerous of different people um, claiming for increasing stock numbers and the mountains weren't just able to hold them. And so with the mass amount of sheep um, constantly grazing and whatnot, the heather eventually disappeared from the hills. Thanks, Michael. I think we're ready to go with the video. We're here on Currying Hill from the village of Gowland below us. They used the natural cover of the river as a safe passage to get to the foot of the mountain. Dinner was a short hike through the thick vegetation here to the caves. Behind us are the cliffs of Curry, and just here to the right of us are the huge boulders that at one time fell away from the cliffs during an ice age. The rocks fell on top of each other, and as they did, they created large chambers underneath these boulders. These are the caves of Curry, and this is where the rebels hid during the War of Independence. Here amongst the boulders, there's a passageway that leads in between two large boulders. 
we're going to go in and have a look and see how far in this chamber goes. This is the main body of the chamber and it measures roughly around 3 metres wide by 4 metres long so it's quite substantial and as you can see these huge boulders make it up fall on top of each other to create these chambers inside. Over here is where we discovered sulphur remains of ash and within inside of it there were animal bones that were burned. This was dating back pre during these troubled times possibly back to maybe thousands of years ago. While over here the chamber continues on down underneath these large rocks to produce a safe cover for rebels at night where people could be outside them and would not know that there's a column of up to 20 men laying inside this chamber. Also another feature of these caves is it's got a separate entrance so you can come out a different side of these boulders than from where you came in. And this was a great safety feature again. And it gives you panoramic views of the valleys below. So you can see from outside this entrance if there's any troops emerging up the hill. So after discovering these chambers, um, I realized that there was so many more stories that we were exposed to as young people in the mountains down there of the history from long ago. And there was lots of stories of highwaymen along the Bangor Trail who would rob people returning back from fairs and marks which uh, they're taken and take their money and hide them in various different caves throughout the mountains on Curry Bay, Sleeve Car, and... Um, I'd often thought that maybe there are more caves up in these hills and um, that we have to look at is in a whole completely different area of view, viewpoint than we had been in the past. That these caves were obviously made up of huge boulders and whatnot. So that's Lavi Germid, I know it's out of focus here at the moment. And we were told that there's an old story about that primary fort that uh, Germid de Gronje stayed there while they were on the run from Fimicul back in ancient Ireland. And uh, so, it was full of myths and stories from around the caves, all from around the mountains also. So I set out looking for other potential cave sites throughout the mountains. And um, I found a number of different caves throughout the hills and different hills. And uh, here on Bingurum, um, we found, I found this cave um, scattered inside. It's a lot of animal bones and this crystallized skull of uh, an early grazing sheep. Um, down in Curry Bay, I found some other smaller caves. Never found the, the big ones that they were saying where all these highwaymen head out. But um, found some art, interesting artifacts like um, a goat skull there, as you can see on the right, and a few other mountain sheep. And uh, then one particular day, I had already searched uh, Gurren for caves and came across a couple of small ones, but um, nothing too major. But I was up over the summit of Gurren here, and um, as I, I came down over the beautiful mountain Corrie Lake of Loch Dew, that's tucked away just on the east side of the mountain, about halfway up. And um, while I was down there, it was a lovely day. I decided to jump in for a quick swim after my hike. And um, as I was coming out of the, the waters, I could see a fox just watching me from a distance. And um, 
the fox slowly made her way um, towards the north of the hill and kept looking back at me as I was emerging out of the water. And uh, so I thought, this guy wants me to, to follow her. So I started following the fox and she went up to, the, to an area underneath the cliffs of um, Bingurum, where there's a large, a large boulder. So from there, I lost sight of her. So I decided, you know, I had a bit of time in my hand that um, I'd go looking underneath the boulders again to see could I find any caves on the hills. And um, just to the right-hand side of this huge boulder, um, it doesn't look like much there, but I managed to crawl underneath that little gap. And to my surprise, when I crawled underneath there, it opened up into a large um, tunnel going back up into the mountain. Now, this is an idea of just the scale of these boulders, um, just standing there beside one of them, and they're quite massive. So I went into the little entrance, and uh, I was really surprised that, um, that this cave was here, and it went all the way back. And the great thing about this was that this was new. Um, I hadn't actually heard of any real um, stories of caves around this area. However, we were told a story about Loch Dew, the mountain lake, that it was not a place to be after, do after dusk. Um, it was said that the fairies, or the, the little people, as some would call them, would be out. And um, that if you were up there after this time, that they would make you lose your way and that uh, you couldn't find your way back to us. It was their spot where they would gather at the night. So a week later, after finding this cave, uh, I decided to bring a friend of mine who was home from Holland, his name is Jab, and um, up to show him this cave. He has a great love for our Irish mountains and our boglands, and um, he loves to go hiking every time he comes back to Ireland. So as I was bringing Jab up to the mountain, I stopped off in Newport a day or two beforehand, and uh, I was talking with John and Claire Chambers up to Nathan Beggars, and I told him about the cave, and I was going to be heading up there with a friend from Holland, and if any of them wanted to come, to, to come along. So uh, Frank Mack, the great mountain man in Shamor himself, um, he came along with us, and Larissa Marley there in the centre, and Kathleen Mack, Frank's wife, and uh, my niece, Neve, and uh, Aidan from Wexford. They came along with us that day. So again, we climbed up over the summer shop, Nathan Bake, and came down by um, Loch Dew, and uh, back over to the boulders. Now, as we were heading back over to the boulders, a fog had come down and it made it quite difficult to ID which boulder I had found that previous week. And um, I went to the right boulder, but I went into a different entrance and uh, it led into a completely different chamber. And it was shorter than the, the other caves I had found the previous week. So I knew I was in the wrong cave. Um, but there was these, I couldn't ID them properly at the time because we just had a mobile phone with me. But I found a lot of these curved white um, chalky kind of um, material scattered along the floor of the cave. And I shouted out to the guys, it's the wrong cave, but come in anyway. There's stuff all along the floor of the cave here. So as they came in, uh, they all took out their mobile phones and lit them up. And uh, we started seeing a lot of other bones scattered throughout the floor. And here we have the famous boots of Frank McManaman and there beside the bone and just to give you an indication of uh, some of the bones that we found. These bones, we knew there and then that they were very old. How old, we had no idea. And um, they were very flaky. Um, if they were there for much longer, there would have been very, very little of them left. And an interesting thing about the bones was there was quartz rocks placed around them um, as they were laid down into the ground in between these, these rocks. Now, we spent time up in the hills with an archaeologist called Marion Dowd, and uh, she did a full recovery on behalf of the National Museums of the site. And um, we had fascinating conversations in there as we, as we were um, retrieving these bones from the, from the site and whatnot. And it looked as if there was a Pacific bed made within the boulder. And um, the bed then was made up of a mixture of clay and little chips of quartz rocks mixed through it, and also a lot of bone fragments mixed through it. 
and a body would have been laid on top of this pit and left to decompose. This process would take six to seven months. And after that time, the people would go back inside and they would crack the skulls open with a uh, rock, possibly. And this was seen as a way of freeing the soul. They believed the soul was in the skull into the, so the soul could move on to the other world. They'd remove the larger bones then, like a large, of the larger skull fragments and uh, large bones, and they would place them into a sacred place as a portal, possibly, into the afterworld with their, with their spirits. So it's quite, um, to me, um, evident that the nearby Loch Dhu would have been one such place. Um, again, along the shore of Loch Dhu, especially on the southern end of it, there's a huge amount of quartz rocks, uh, roughly around the same size as the quartz rocks in the cave um, around the shore of the lake. And um, it, I, you could see how they would have placed the bones into the, the lake as they'd seen it as a portal into the afterworld. A lot of these quarry lakes would have been very prominent with ancient goddesses like um, Anya and Bridges and whatnot. They, the waters were seen as a purity and a growth of life and whatnot. And um, also the great Morrigan, the phantom goddess, she was seen as um, the god of uh, death and complete the cycle of life. And death was a very important part of the ancient Gael's cycle of life and the degree of understanding of it. And everything was interlinked. So they left the bodies back to Mother Earth and uh, they left her on a height that it would overlook their people and look down on them. And uh, of course, the god, moon god, the god Morrigan was referred to as a great moon goddess and she would look down on her people at night and uh, she would call them up to the heavens when their time had done. And she has found in some of the old myths of Ireland and um, in the Cú Cullen sagas, obviously, and also this a form of the Morrigan in the, uh, in the Tooth and Dandannon. She, she flew over the battlefield and she put fear into the Yemenis uh, uh, after the Tooth and Dandannon. But it's evident that she was even here long before that, as ancient manuscripts say that she was part of a, a triple goddess, a very powerful, um, possibly even here since the beginning of era itself. So these bones um, have been radiocarbon dated and um, they had dated back close to 6,000 years old. And what was fascinating even more so about this site was that there was charcoal in there also with them. And um, the charcoal has been really on carbidaceous, but that's been dating back to close to 8,000 years old. So it shows that humans passed through these hills and stayed a night or two or even longer in these caves over 8,000 years ago. And um, these rituals that happened 6,000 years ago were going on for 1,200 years um, from the age of the youngest bones to the older bones that were in there. Altogether, they could ID up to 10 individuals um, from a young age of two up to the fully grown adults of 40. Um, they got DNA from two samples of two different bones and there is a family link of a great, 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 great grandson of one or the other. And it seems to be probably only males that were left in here as some sort of ritual um, to the, into the mountains and whatnot. So here's just an idea of uh, working inside the cave and some of the bones there, as you can see in invertebrae and uh, the teeth there to the right. And the teeth, some of the teeth were in pristine condition, believe it or not, as unbelievable as the bones were flaking away into dust. The teeth were still very, very, very prominent. And um, I have a picture here of a clear chambers on the Nathan Big Mountains. I just want to give her a mention. Uh, Claire was very prominent uh, in the recovery up there working with Dr. Dowd and uh, had a great lore and love for the site and, uh, and, and the mythical connection to it. And she, she even found a lot of connections that were very similar to what Native Americans would have been doing with, uh, with their dead uh, around the same time, even though they were se separated by uh, an ocean where um, they would have similar beliefs about even the dead back to Mother Earth and whatnot. Also said about the Nathan Beggars and John uh, Chambers, they spend a lot of time after the initial finds up there looking for more possible sites. And they found a few more smaller caves with a lot of mittens, muscle shells inside and uh, in the base of the, the chambers. So again, I'm going to ask uh, Meg just to 
show a quick video again. And this one is going to take you into these caves on Bingurum and show you what it was like finding these caves. After coming down from the summit of the mountain, I stopped off by Luck Do, just below us here, and went for a swim. After I came out of the water, I noticed a fox standing roughly around here, staring down at me. As I looked up at the fox, she slowly made her way towards the boulders, looking back at me every so often, so I decided to follow her. I followed the fox to this area here on Bingurum beneath the cliff. The fox disappeared in behind the boulders there, and I got a sudden urge to go and explore the boulders to see if I could find another boulder chamber like the caves on Curring Hill that I discovered just a few years beforehand. I made my way here to this boulder and seen a small entrance underneath it and I decided to go in and have a look. As I made our way in through the passage, the cave zigzags its way down here and in here to the right. Altogether, it's up on 20 plus metres in length. And I decided to come back a week later with some friends of mine and show them this cave that I was just after discovering. After coming back a week later from finding the original cave, I landed here on this other side of the huge boulder. I wasn't sure of the entrance that I had found the previous week and I told my friends just to give me a second till I checked it out, was this the main entrance? After making my way into this chamber, I realised I was in a different chamber altogether. I noticed a lot of items on the floor, curve shapes like bowl shaped items. And I called out to my friends that it's the wrong cave, but come in anyway, there's stuff scattered around the floor. When everyone came in and we used the light from our phones, we discovered a number of other bones. When I was in here with the archaeologists and we were finding the different bones and whatnot, I couldn't help but think of the old myths and legends that we grew up listening to about the moon goddess, the Morrigan, the goddess of death, who would come and take the warriors from this world into the afterworld. So much of the rituals here would be similar to what we were told of ancient people leaving their remains back to Mother Earth and placing them in sacred places like the little quarry lake near us looked do. That would have been seen as a portal into the afterworld. And when the moon goddess rose up into the sky and lit her light upon the lake, they would follow her golden path back up to the sky and take their place beside her in the starry sky at night. One thing we noticed about the bones that were left here, they were surrounded by quartz rock. Quartz rock was seen as a very special rock by the ancient people. Its white colours and purity meant that it would protect them from evil spirits. And when the quartz was rubbed together, it would shine a light upon the dead to keep them safe on their journey to the afterworld. So I'd like to thank you all for joining us here today. And uh, so that takes us to the end of the presentation. And here we have the moon rising up over Buckle Mountain and shining down on Loch Fear that's below our house in um, the Wild Nathan uh, area and the Mio Dark Sky Park. And so as you can see, we're surrounded by the myths um, all around us in the Nathan Big Mountains. And when you come down to Lechakeen again and to Burrasool or Clegg and Belly Cry to look at the dark sky, um, just remember that a lot of our history and mythology are associated with the stars above us also, and uh, just to bring a bit more uh, character to the area and whatnot. Uh, again, thank you all for joining me here today. Michael, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. Not a bother, Fiona. Thanks for having me. And thanks uh, to Mags in the background. We, ha we do have a few questions, and I think we have time for them. Um, yeah. James Garrity is saying, I, I have often walked along the Bangor Way, and some people suggest that the Romans built a road there. 
What is your opinion on this? It, I actually never heard of that now till now beforehand. But um, it's one of the earliest tracks that we know about through the mountains. And it's even mentioned in the Catharades of Mayo with Queen Maeve. There's dim days, um, the northwest Mayo region, which made up of um, we call three boundaries of Trioli, uh, Barasul and Eris. And uh, to get from Trioli, you had to go down by a long Nathan moor and across the the valleys between Burin and Boca and that uh, would bring you to Lechikin and back up along the Bangor Trail that would bring you up to uh, Eris. And of course, um, along Lechikin area, there's a number of um, Ringfort and um, Cranoaks uh, dating back and are featured. Uh, Listening here, Ringfort is featured in the tales also. Thanks for that. And, and Colette is asking, um, she just wants to know the, the name and title of the book that you were referring to in your talk. So maybe that's a question that you might reply to her directly afterwards. If you stay, yeah. stay in the presentation and you can look through the questions. No um, problem at all. Uh, Kira is asking, were the flying column not afraid of any superstitions attached to the caves? That's an interesting uh, one. They would have been more afraid, I'd say, of uh, the enemy that was uh, on their tails because they were after getting a very um, a, uh, badly beaten in, in the Camino ambush. And uh, these guys were all young men. So they would have been in the early 20s, the majority of them, and late teens. And uh, so obviously that age, you, you're kind of fearless anyway. But uh, to them, it, it was to get away from the, the, the black and hands as best they can. And a special mention at this time to the, to the women of the village of Sixgarder, Shamor in this area, the forgotten heroes, as I do often call them. They were the ones who were left to deal with the force and the brutality of the enemy forces who came looking for them in. They were the ones that knew where they were hidden in the hills and fed them, and they never gave them up. And um, you know, they, they they took a lot of um, the the hardships from that time. Thanks, thanks, Michael. Uh, sadly, I don't think we've any time for any more of the questions. But I know that you will stay online and have a look at those questions that have been posed. And uh, it, it just remains for me to say thank you. A really fascinating and also very personal account that I think everybody will have engaged with. And thanks again, Michael. No problem, Fiona. Thank you again for having me.